This video is sponsored by Geology. The Spider-Man that has to confront his morals or his ideals is the best Spider-Man. I think the last time I truly felt this was in Homecoming, when Peter has to sacrifice his happiness to stop the Vulture. That was light and simple and I quite enjoyed that, but No Way Home finally digs deeper, reaching the intensity of the previous live-action Spider-Man by asking the pivotal question, when? When is it your problem? Now he's gonna get away with my money. I missed the part where that's my problem. Stop that guy! Hey, kids, little help. Not my policy. I don't care anymore. I'm done. When do you take responsibility for not only yourself and those around you, but those you don't necessarily think about? Heck, those you might hate. Spider-Man's motto is, with great power, there must also come great responsibility, a message that's been ingrained to the character since his inception. And finally, after three movies, Tom Holland's Spider-Man learns that lesson in probably the best sequence of Spider-Man No Way Home. Today on Why It Works, I want to break down exactly why the apartment sequence from Spider-Man No Way Home is so great, and why it stands out so intensely from the rest of the movie. But first, let's talk about today's sponsor. Geology is a nine-time award-winning men's skincare company recognized in Men's Health, Esquire, and Ask Men Grooming Awards. And their simple and effective skincare routine is customized just for you with ingredients that are proven to work and formulated for daily use. Their skincare is built around just a handful of powerful proven ingredients that have been trusted by dermatologists for decades. Geology skincare helps you fight acne, reduce oiliness, prevent wrinkles, and more. I've actually been sponsored by Geology a while back and have been using their products and I feel amazing. My skin feels so much healthier, it's awesome. And hey, if you feel good, you'll feel confident in your own skin and you'll look good because of it. Click the link provided, take a 30 second diagnostic quiz, and their team of dermatologists will design a regimen just for you that is shipped directly to your door. With more than 5,000 five-star reviews, head over to geology.com and take their free skincare quiz to save up to 50% off on your 30-day trial or just click the link below. That's G-E-O-L-O-G-I-E dot com or click on the link below to save 50% off on your 30-day trial. Spider-Man No Way Home is a movie with plenty of issues, from oddly animated CG characters to questionable placement of humor, but when the movie sticks the landing, it becomes peak cinema. One of the things I've noticed is how little people talk about the first third of this movie, and the praise really becomes apparent once the film reaches its second and third acts. That's because the film has found its footing tone-wise and has clearly defined Spider-Man's goal. Help the villains get back home, and then later on, get revenge on the Green Goblin. And the moment the film has this shift starts around the time Spider-Man defeats Doctor Strange, but truly solidifies itself in the apartment sequence, which is what I want to talk about. Now for clarification, while the ensemble of characters enter the apartment and vibe for a bit, and we see Peter figuring out how to cure Doctor Octopus with Norman Osborn's help, for me the apartment sequence truly begins the moment after Doctor Octopus is cured by Peter Parker. Because this is where I feel the movie finally plants its feet, and this is the part of the sequence I want to talk about. So, Peter Peter cures Octavius, who rewards Peter with a nice gold suit, and as happy as making his way towards his apartment, we begin. The main takeaway right off the bat is that there's no music. Music can be used to enhance a scene, sure, but not including music can also prove effective. The lack of sound during a conversation, only hearing room tone, can greatly increase an unnerving feeling for the audience. The movie is no longer indicating how you should feel, and due to that, you immediately recognize something's not right. Octavius enters the makeshift lab, telling Norman that he'll finally be whole again. It'll just be him, no more darker half, to which Norman responds, Just me. And there's this uncomfortable amount of lingering. We know the goblin can't be dead, we know this not only from earlier in the movie, but from the Raimi Spider-Man films. Defoe's change in vocal tone from prior scenes too indicate that Octavius might not be talking to Norman Osborn in this scene, but rather the Green Goblin. As this is happening, Peter's trying to cure Max Dillon. Now, I want to point out that the apartment sequence is one of the most John Wattsy parts of the entire movie. There's something about it that feels very calculated. Like, the movie took a break from being a fun super product, like it stopped checking all these boxes on things it had to do, and just wanted to be a sequence of incredibly well-done scenes to achieve an emotional outcome. I mentioned Watts' direction because this sequence reminded me a lot of Cop Car. Watts uses silence a lot in that movie and then adds one auditory background element to further perturb the audience. 
So for example, in Cop Car, the child protagonists are put in a perilous situation. And sure, silence would make everything uncomfortable. No music increases the feeling that we're really there with the characters, right? Because as we all know, background music sadly doesn't exist in real life. But like I said before, he adds one simple rhythmic sound that keeps going and going in the background. In this scene, it's a windmill. The rhythmic creaking noise is an added sound in the atmosphere of the scene and it stays there throughout. Almost like a constant reminder that time is passing, this is happening. To put it simply, it's creepy. And I'll throw him against the ground as hard as I can. And so, I'll stomp him with my boot. Now moving back to Spider-Man No Way Home, we have no music. Peter fits a device on Electro which will cure him, and this thing makes this sound. <sighs> Something feels off. What do you mean? So you can see how Watts is using a technique he's skilled at once more. So we're just increasing the tension here. Plus, Electro's device now works as a timer. We know something's going down, and now we recognize that once that timer finishes, it'll either be a good outcome or a bad one. And due to how the scene is being set up, it feels like the timer won't get to finish. As this is happening, music finally begins to creep in. It's slow and yet again unnerving to fit the scene. As J. Jonah Jameson reaches the apartment building ready to film Spider-Man. Oh, where is he? Uh, he's inside. Anyways, we finally reached the oh-so-fun dolly shot. I remember reading that No Way Home was going to have a lot of Raimi cam, essentially a lot of push-ins and dynamic camera movements. And to be honest, they were scarce and utilized in moments that I feel weren't really necessary. It would have been cooler to have them pop up in a lot of dramatic moments. Like in my head, when Dr. Octopus first appeared on the bridge, I genuinely thought they were going to recreate this scene from Spider-Man 2, just with Tom Holland. That would have been great. Either way, we have this dolly shot which is perfect for the scene. Peter's spider sense goes off and the telephoto shot becomes a wide shot. And due to this, we see more of the background, of course. And this is also a cool visual cue that Peter is now more aware of his surroundings. Now, the scene persists. We track Peter as he walks around the apartment, and it's just so great. Before finally pulling back and we get a clear read on everything in the room. Someone is up to something, and it's someone in this shot. The music that has been seeping into the background is now rising to the surface, and the music is now what's dictating the scene. Michael Giacchino's music here is constantly beating, adding unease, and the sound is reminiscent to a heart, and it stops completely the second Peter locates the bad guy. And of course, the bad guy is the Green Goblin. So the goblin monologues here, and he talks about how people like Peter, people with power, shouldn't have to resort to helping or fixing themselves. Those in power should be able to take what they want, do what they want, because that's what it means to be powerful. It's the antithesis of with great power comes great responsibility. It's with great power comes no responsibility, essentially. Heck, Goblin's ideology goes as far as to recognizing that if Peter wants to, he should be able to kill all the villains, i.e. sending them back to their worlds, because he has the power to do so. But Peter follows May's quote-unquote holy, holy moral, moral mission, mission, which the Goblin deems weak. And this goes back to my thoughts on what makes a good Spider-Man story. It's all about that internal conflict. Should I choose what benefits me, or should I allow myself to care about others at the risk of letting go of what I want? And in one sentence, the Goblin wraps up what the whole movie's about. I've watched you struggling to have everything you want while the world tries to make you choose. Peter has to come to terms with the fact that being Spider-Man means losing the things you care about sometimes. It means risking your own life to save the lives of others. He can't have everything he wants, that's not how it works. And as all of this is happening, we're at the very end. It's time for action. Me. Run. Sandman escapes, Lizard escapes, Electro blasts Dr. Octopus out of the building, and Peter clashes with the Goblin as May tries to flee the building. Spider-Man vs. the Green Goblin here is very raw and brutal. Like it doesn't cut away or anything when punches hit, is what I mean. It's not filmed in a very heightened way, which would have been cool, but I appreciate the down-to-earth feel of it. There isn't much slow-mo or crazy visual effects where Spider-Man's swinging around everywhere. A lot of this fight is practical, and you can tell and stunt dudes practiced it. Tom Holland really got on wires and wall bounce towards Defoe in this scene, and by having someone actually do this in person, the scene feels that much more real and tangible. Defoe kills it in this movie, by the way, and in general, the utilization of all these phenomenal actors is perfect. So many scenes play to their strengths, both Molina and Defoe get to show off their human and their villain side, and that's always awesome. 
how great would it be to see Alfred Molina again and Willem Dafoe and get to see Willem Dafoe without the mask to be able to bring them all together and to like find a way to finish their storylines maybe in a different way. I'm getting off track. Anyways, Peter webs a window to shatter it open, which is one of the sickest things ever. The helicopter becomes ever more present and Peter looks down to see J. Jonah Jameson. One of the best things about this is that it's Tom. Because he's unmasked, they can't use a CG model like in Homecoming where he's climbing the Washington Monument for this close-up. And so the scene feels so much more real as we see a person clearly on the wall. It's simple stuff like that that's nice to see, you know? But Rutro, the lizard, pops up, grabbing Peter and slamming him back into the apartment. He can't escape this. This leads to one of the craziest things I've ever seen in a Spider-Man movie, which is funny because it's so simple. Sometimes the simpler the better. And we crash into the lobby. Aunt May is there, and we reach the conclusion of the apartment scene. Your weakness, Peter, is morality. It's choking you! Here, Aunt May stabs the goblin with the serum, but it doesn't work. I assume it's either really difficult to create, or the goblin tampered with it so it wouldn't be effective. Either way, Peter and May are kinda screwed. He got it from you, that pathetic sickness! So the goblin here is doubling down on his belief that using your powers to do things that benefit others is weak, and as we all know, decides to teach Peter a lesson by killing May. Also, it's great to see explosions turn green here. That's always fun. Both are wounded in this scene, but May's wounds are fatal. It seems she doesn't even realize she's dying, being in shock. And before she collapses, she tells Peter the words he needs to hear the most. Words I'm assuming this version of Peter Parker has never heard before. And with great power, there must also come great responsibility. There's no music swelling. It's a serious line told in a serious scene. Same as every other previous interpretation of the line. It's not necessarily beautiful or heartwarming. It's just a brutally honest line. A burden that Peter carries the rest of his life. In Spider-Man's first appearance, it's a saying Peter recognizes for himself immediately after his realization that his inaction led to Uncle Ben's death. That's how the issue ends. Modern interpretations of the line have used Uncle Ben as the one to tell Peter this, and it just so happens that in this version of Spider-Man, it's May who tells Peter. An interesting way to resolve the issue, some would say character trait, that the MCU Spider-Man movies had. The issue of Peter's constant clumsiness, his insecurity, his decision to push his responsibility onto another. He was never taught his most important lesson. With great, great power, power comes great responsibility. To put it simply, if someone's hurt, you help them. Even if it costs you something. Because when you have gifts, you have to use them for the good of mankind. Aunt May falls and starts dying, you know how it is with Peter's parental figures. Peter's going through it, the lesson hasn't really clicked yet, and the Department of Damage Control arrests Happy, who attempts to buy Peter enough time to escape. A new motif created by Michael Giacchino begins to play, one that I think is connected to May's character, and it integrates itself into the main Spider-Man theme for the remainder of the movie. An auditory reminder that Peter carries this weight now, and will keep carrying it as Spider-Man. Finally, the perfect way to end the sequence. Peter gets shot and has to run away, and a single tear falls down May's cheek before cutting to black. The movie has a lot of great moments, heck, everything involving the Spider-Men is awesome, but unlike the simple, pretty boring cutting back and forth, the shot-reverse shot of a lot of their conversations, Watts decided to really hone in on making this apartment sequence as visually engaging as possible. And that's why this moment works. Alright, thanks so much for watching. Make sure to check out Interstellar Ranger Commence. The first episode is already out on the channel. Episode 2 will release in June. Thanks so much, Zandre Short, for the fan art. I love your art style so much. These look great. If you have fan art you want to showcase, please tweet at me, the Interstellar Ranger Commence Twitter account, or send it to me via Discord. Thanks so much, patrons, for the support. Some of y'all have been supporting me for so long, and it really helps a ton and means so much. I'm doing my best to make sure my videos, as well as IRC, come out awesome for y'all. So make sure to like and subscribe and turn on those bell notifications to not miss a single video the Brown Table channel puts out. Thanks so much for coming to the table.